really focus in on Gen Z, um, what's changing spending habits and predictive uh, information for the future. So today is a day you are not gonna wanna miss. And I must um, thank our major sponsor, which is LIM College. Um, what, what a great team there. We love working with them. Um, you know, from our Next Generation Awards, which is gonna start up in just a couple of weeks. I cannot believe school is about to start again uh, to, you know, just long-term partnerships on so many different projects. Um, check, check out what's happening there. If you see a student with an LIM resume, um, definitely uh, pick it up and take a look because we're really excited about everything that, um, the team, the team is doing and excited that there's gonna be students back again this year and we look forward to meeting them. So I want to introduce our first speaker, John Dick. John is the founder and CEO of Civic Sciences. Um, John has presented for us before, super popular. And what Civic Sciences does is, um, it's a market intelligence company. So they are able to look at uh, consumer behaviors and um, you know, the, insights, the insights that they come out with uh, based on one, you know, I, I'm sure he can explain this better, but you, know, you fill out a survey and it tells you predictive behaviors. And John has a newsletter that comes out every Saturday. And I'm telling you, it's a highlight of my, um, one of the highlights of my Saturday morning. I've forwarded it to many of you. Um, I think he's going to let us know how to get onto that list at the end of the presentation. So um, it is my pleasure to welcome John. Let's see. There you go. All right. Thank you, Karen. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. I hope everyone's seeing my screen. Um, let's get this full size. There we go. Uh, awesome. Well, look, it's great. It's, it was a, almost a year ago to the day that I last visited with this group, which in what a year it's been. Um, so for those of you who weren't here last year, a little bit about civic science We're based in Pittsburgh, uh, consumer uh, intelligence, market intelligence company. We have a fairly simple but ambitious kind of view of, of research, which is that uh, everything affects everything and it's always changing. So we have to study all of it constantly. And, and that's a hard thing to do, but it's really important. And it's important because um, when we get to myopic about the way we look at consumers or look at our markets or our brand, we miss all of these influences around people that are affecting their decisions and their attitudes and their behaviors. And uh, I am by no means an expert in your industry. Um, that's Marshall Cohen. That's most of you, right? I am, uh, I am here to enlighten you about some larger trends going on in the world, the macro trends, macroeconomic, macro cultural, uh, and maybe tease a little bit how we think they're weighing in on, on your category, your industry, and potentially even your brand. Uh, I'm going to cover a lot of ground today uh, because I want to kind of throw a bunch of these trends at you. And then hopefully um, we can go down whatever rabbit hole you may choose to go down uh, in the Q&A at the end. So please um, don't be shy with any questions when we finish. A uh, little bit about where our data comes from. Uh, so we are a survey company. Civic Science gathers data by asking people questions. I wish there was a better word than survey. Uh, but we do have a particularly radically innovative way of doing it. Um, we are uh, we have polls administered inside of content of premium, hundreds of premium publishers that people answer voluntarily. They're not compensated in any way. Uh, they answer because we tell them cool things about themselves at the end. And uh, we have a lot of evidence that that just produces more reliable, stable data. But more importantly, it allows us to produce a ton of data, uh, really an unprecedented amount of survey research, up to 5 million uh, responses to our surveys a day, uh, which really is, allows us to study thousands of things things and how those thousands of things relate to one another, which is the everything affects everything part of the story. Uh, I'm not going to get too much more into methodology. Happy to answer questions about that later or take it offline. Uh, this slide was in my deck a year ago. Uh, and it has been in every deck I have done since March of last year. Uh, and it's perhaps right? even, yes. We don't see your slides yet. Are you, are you serious? Yeah. Oh, no. Why not? Let's go back. I don't know. That's the beauty of live. I'm um, share screen share. All right. Well, I, there we go. There we go. How about now? Perfect. All right. 
Okay, good. Thanks for interrupting me. All right, that was the first slide you missed. That's the second slide you missed. Um, a little bit about our methodology and where our polls are done. This slide was in my deck a year ago uh, and has been in every deck I've done since March of 2020. Um, this, the important takeaway from this slide has always been that we're so focused on what governments and businesses allow us to do or not do that we lose sight of the fact that nobody has more power over how this pandemic will progress and eventually end, hopefully, than the consumer. Um, each and every one of us is doing a calculus every second of every day, measuring the, our desire for safety versus our desire for normalcy. Each of us does that calculus differently, and it has huge implications for everything about us, which we're going to spend some time talking about. Um, this slide's already a few weeks old, and I can tell you it's already changed. Um, uh, close to 40% of Americans now are saying that even if they're allowed to go back to everything normal, they're probably going to be maybe only do some certain normal activities, and about 10 to 12% of Americans say, I'm going to stay in quarantine. Right? It doesn't matter what government allows us to do, what the mandates say, right? People are deciding for themselves how they feel about this in good ways and bad, by the way. We'll talk about the COVID cautious and the COVID cavalier in a bit. Um, one of the things we pay very close attention to, which I know probably many of you do, is the macroeconomic picture. We have an economic sentiment index that we've that we've done every single day since 2011. It's measuring people's attitudes towards the housing market, the job market, spending, savings, um, the U.S. economy writ large, uh, and consumer confidence has been lagging since March. Um, it after sort of a pretty nice peak, it's been falling. We had a little bit of a, a positive bump two or three weeks ago. It fell again over the last two plus weeks. Um, uh, you know, consumers' attitudes are tenuous right now, but that's a little bit peculiar because um, if you look at the actual reality of U.S. consumers' financial health right now, it's tremendous. If I had told you uh, last May or even last August when we met that this pandemic would still be somewhat raging a year later and uh, almost a third of Americans would say they were better off financially than they were before the pandemic and that the vast majority of Americans were at least as well off, if not better off, you probably would have said I was crazy. I would have thought I was crazy for saying that. Uh, I don't think there was any, any of us that believed this pandemic would ultimately be a net positive for the average US consumer, but it has turned out to be. Um, if you've maintained your job and your income and owned your business, uh, successfully through the last 18 months, chances are you have more money than you did before. Um, put stimulus as a factor, all the categories we couldn't spend in last year, the vacations we didn't take, the clothes we didn't buy, unfortunately, right? Um, people stockpiled money, savings rates are at record high, household debts are at record low. Uh, and so why, why the negative economic sentiment? Well, one answer might have been inflation, but even concerns about inflation have been falling. Um, after sort of a peak of May, um, they, they've started to fall a bit. People just aren't as concerned about the cost of goods. They feel like it maybe is maybe a little bit overinflated, uh, for uh, pun intended. Um, so that's not really driving the negative economic sentiment either. So what is? What is, is fear over the virus, very simply. Um, our consumer confidence, and this started five, six years ago, consumer confidence has become a measure more of hope and fear than it has of financial reality. Um, and, and a lot of that is driven, quite frankly, by the political environment. Um, and I'm going to get into a couple slides on that in a little bit. But as, as the pandemic has sort of returned, or I guess resurged, um, people have grown less confident about their, both their personal financial position and just the overall outlook of the economy, uh, and has caused people to maybe start to retract a little bit. Uh, we're not seeing that in spending just yet, but if things progress into the fall, we, we, we may very well. And so we, th we think about consumer confidence as truly a measure of my job status and my housing status and so forth, but it has, it has rapidly become more of a future casting measure of people's fears and hopes about uh, in this case, the pandemic, but oftentimes the political landscape and so on. Um, and so uh, just a couple categories that we're tracking in terms of how comfortable people feel doing all of these things. By and large, it's really good. I mean, we're seeing heights of uh, comfort going to restaurants, certainly com comfort shopping in stores, even travel is, you know, uh, and the majority of Americans are comfortable traveling and even attending large public events like concerts and so on. So uh, now we are starting to see these numbers slide a little bit, admittedly, with um, the Delta surgeons, but um, we're still well above half in most cases. So it's, uh, let's just hope it doesn't continue to get worse. Uh, of course, um, Reasons to be sort of concerned going forward is of, of the, the U.S. adults who have yet, or U.S. 13 and up, who have yet to be vaccinated, over half of them have no intent to do that. Uh, and we, as you probably know, if you've picked up a, 
uh, read a newspaper article in the late in the last couple months, we know we're having a very difficult time breaking through to that group. That group, of course, tends to skew rural, actually much more Gen X, right? So we kind of know um, who that who that group would be. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk now about vaccine mandates, whether they're being uh, created by businesses or created by governments. Uh, we haven't seen many government mandates yet, but uh, we ask consumers how they feel about ma vaccine mandate measures. Um, the majority of US adults support them in pretty much every um, category of retail, ex excuse me, category of consumerism, except retail. Um, it's still more people uh, approve than disapprove, but a majority of Americans do not agree uh, in sort of vaccine mandated proof of vaccination to shop in different places. But uh, these numbers aren't overwhelming. I mean, yes, it's a majority and it's a relatively clear majority in most cases, but but still it's, you know, 52, 48 um, is a little bit better than a coin flip in the restaurant category. So this is a, this is a tricky one. We're going to keep a close eye on this as the fall gets closer. Um, and school begins and so forth. But, um, you know, the one thing I always tell everyone is we spent, you know, everything I've showed you by so far has been sort of what we call a top line result. These are representative samples of the US consumer population that we map to, you know, census breaks of men and women and age and so forth. But the world doesn't work that way. Uh, we don't, um, these top line numbers are, are often mask a lot of nuance and some of the really important things that you need to understand particularly what categories you're in and what what consumer you sell to right who buys your product and 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 so you're you you most likely aren't selling your product to the US census you are selling it to some subset of the population and we need to think about the world that way we live in a very bifurcated increasingly bifurcated um, country of consumers across demographics and political and where they live, right? These are all influences on, you know, how they're reacting to the pandemic, how that's affecting their, their purchasing behavior, their shopping behavior, their media consumption, right? So we want to dig that extra level down. And we see it so many different ways. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I, I talk about to one blue in the face that's not getting enough attention is the, is the, is the tragedy of how much more of an outsized impact this pandemic has had on women than men. Um, and that is both in mental health, physical health, financial health. Um, women have borne much more of the responsibility of caring for children and, and also um, elderly parents, by the way, um, because elderly parents are, are greater risk. And so a lot of that burden, both the logistical and the emotional burden of that has fallen on women heads of household and has just worn on them. Um, we, know, we know millions of women have left, left the workforce since in the last 18 months yet and not to return. Um, part of that is because they've taken on a dis disproportionate share of those, those responsibilities. But another part of it is that women still make 80 cents on the dollar compared to men. And so when families have had to make a decision about who's going to stay home with the kids during this period of time, it wasn't a coin flip, right? This is a huge problem. It's an absolute tragedy. We have to talk about it more. We have to focus more on, 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 on fixing it going forward, but it does have implications on consumer behavior, right? Um, also, race, another thing that has been exacerbated over the last 18 months for two reasons. One, of course, were the social injustice crises we um, that sort of hit a, a peak last summer and have not gone away. Um, but also non-white Americans have either had more difficulty accessing a vaccine um, or are still more reticent than, than the average consumer for frankly, lots of um, justifiable historical public health reasons, right? So these things are gonna have an implication going forward. Uh, incidentally, uh, I didn't even include a slide on it in this presentation, but the rich have gotten richer. Um, uh, I, so sort of, uh, Kind of going back to that slide I had about household income increasing, um, rich people have, have outpaced non-rich people significantly in their economic gains over the last 18 months, um, largely because A, they probably were less likely to lose their job, B, they were able to significantly uh, benefit from the stock market gains over the last year and a half. So, so we're just seeing a lot of this bifurcation. One of them uh, that probably everybody can nod in agreement or roll their eyes about is the political tribalism that really predicts, I, I could spend a whole talk just on this alone. We're going to mention it a couple different ways because it does affect, um, it predicts, frankly, people's attitudes toward the pandemic and attitudes toward vaccines and attitudes toward vaccine mandates more than anything. Not gender, not age, not race, not income, anything. It's political party affiliation. No big shocker. Uh, and even today, um, Democrats are twice as likely as Republicans to say that it's going to be at least four months until they feel comfortable eating at a restaurant again. Right. And, and I'm going to explain to you a little bit about why that matters in a minute. Um, where else does it manifest itself? It manifests itself in things like um, inflation concerns, tariff concerns, which I know is a big deal among this group. Um, 
Notice that Republicans are significantly more concerned about inflation than Democrats. Is it because inflation is affecting Republicans more than Democrats? Not really, maybe a little bit in some categories like fuel and lumber, but by and large, no. Um, these fears about inflation are born of concern about who's in political power and whether they believe those people in political, political power can fix the inflation or whether they're the cause of the inflation, right? So politics is this sort of like, um, cloud or, or underlying burn that's affecting people's views of things, even like inflation. Now, does that is that just an emotional reaction? Sure, but can it manifest itself in how Republicans spend money versus Democrats? Sure, and could that be relevant to you depending on who your customer is or where your store is? Of course it can. So we're gonna spend some time talking about that, right? So when we dig in a little further to the consumer who's least worried about inflation, I already mentioned they tend to lean politically left, but we look at all these other things that are common among that group there. They watch cooking and home and travel content on television. They're more health conscious. They live in the city. They rent more, th more often than they own their home. Um, they're, they, 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 sh they use T-Mobile. They eat at fast casual restaurants. They drink wine. You've got the other group who's most concerned about inflation. In inflation. Incidentally, they're both men. Uh, women tend to be more moderated on the issue of inflation in the middle. Um, men, these are both sort of um, largely white men at either end of the spectrum that are, are either the least worried or most worried about inflation. Um, the most worried group is that Republican I mentioned. You can probably do some stereotyping from there, uh, which is something of a time saver in these cases. Um, there's also a smaller young group that I think is really face dealing with the implications of inflation. That's the younger adult. Um, they're going to be on Snapchat and Pinterest and using AT&T wireless and following college football. Um, another sort of deeper kind of profile look at, say, two, two different groups. I mentioned the COVID cautious and the COVID cavalier. When we study the brand affinities of those two groups, we see a very different picture between those groups. The COVID cautious consumer, um, which again is going to lean a little more politically left, obviously, be a little bit more urban. They like Nike and Trader Joe's and Reebok and Ugg and Subaru, right? The COVID cavalier, who tends to be a bit more Gen X, um, Gen X plus, certainly more rural, lean a little bit more male. Um, they're drinking Budweiser and shopping Carhartt and driving Fords, right? Um, and again, maybe these things aren't like blowing your mind, but because uh, they probably make, hopefully make a lot of sense, but it's important to, depending on what, what your brand, your brand profile, your customer profile looks like to understand um, is my customer more or less likely to step into my store to buy my product or not during this period of time, right? Um, one topic that I think um, uh, just sort of germane to all of us um, is what's the return to work going to look like in the fall? We are paying close attention to this one very ob obviously for tons of reasons because we know commuter commuters drive a lot of consumerism, particularly in urban areas, also like drive-throughs and coffee and QSR category. Um, uh, most Americans are already back at work. Um, although of uh, about 25% are still working from home and a third of those people don't ever expect to go back. And that's a ton of people. Um, that's 8% of US adults, which is a lot of folks not driving to work, not eating at the diner down the street from their office, not parking in the parking garage, right? And, and that number actually, we would expect that number to scale back even more or the number not going back to increase um, the way the pandemic is sort of unfolding right now. We think offices are beginning to slow their return to work policies. Um, Incidentally, um, people like working from home, um, newsflash. Uh, we track how happy people are in their current job. We've tracked this for a decade. Um, notice that, that, that sort of teal line along the bottom, people who say, yes, I'm quote unquote unhappy in my job has been spiking um, pretty dramatically since um, April. Why? Because people have gone back to work. Um, say what you want. Yes, there are benefits to being in an office. There are certainly benefits to employers and having people in the office, but people would rather not be in the office. That's all there is to it. Uh, and we're starting to see that manifest itself in job dis dissatisfaction. That means a lot of things for those of you out there who are employers and hirers of people um, in a job market that is as frothy as ours is, where there's more jobs than there are people, um, expect workers to begin to seek out places that give them more flexibility. And that's already happening, but it's gonna happen in spades uh, in, the, in the weeks and months to come. So, so brace yourself for it or lean into it if you can, because it's inevitable. Um, I'm sure, you heard from Marshall about this last week and everybody since the back to school um, season is coming. Um, clear majority of, of American parents both expect their children to return to school and, and, and hope that they will or prefer that they will. Now, 
um, that number is going to move. I mean, even in our home, uh, home square in a public school district in Pittsburgh, uh, there was a deadline to decide whether your kids were going to go back or do hybrid. Uh, they moved the deadline. They, that deadline was last week. They've already pushed it a couple of weeks because it's such a fluid situation with everyone in terms of what mask policies are going to be and so on. Um, the majority of parents would prefer in person. The majority of parents still expect to do in person. But still, I mean, as many as a third of Americans could still choose to keep their children home from school, at least sometime, uh, to do online school. And of course, that's going to have a lot of implications on how they shop for those children for back to school supplies and clothes and so on. Um, now, um, th that, as I mentioned, that sort of number's already been falling the, into July, and I expect it to fall in, in the weeks to come. Um, that number, uh, there's a greater level of caution about return to school among BIPOC, uh, non-white American households, particularly Hispanic and Black Americans, um, are less kind of comfortable with the idea of their kids returning to in-person school. Uh, lots of, a uh, number of reasons for that. A, they're less likely to be vaccinated than the average consumer, um, but yet still take the, the um, the, 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 the pandemic very seriously. Uh, and also too, a lot of those, um, those um, non-white students are in urban schools. And I think they were um, probably got le uh, worse marks for safety last year during the pandemic. And so, so again, that's gonna have implications on how um, particularly group, groups of consumers may shop uh, for the return to school. Uh, so let's just jump into spending a bit, right? So one of the big things we've watched, actually we work a lot with Marshall Cohen and NPD on this is to track how people spend uh, different uh, slugs of money that they come into. Um, very simple, we're, here we're looking at um, one chart that's from May, which was asking people how they were gonna spend their tax refund. And then, and then again, asking how they were gonna spend their child tax credit. Pretty similar actually, um, but notice that the child tax credit was much more likely to go to things like home improvement and necessities. And in necessities, we include clothes and apparel, right? So a lot of that group of people who said, yes, I'm gonna save or put aside my, my, um, my tax refund, that group of people is saying, I'm gonna use that money for necessities um, and apparel this time around. So that's probably good for all of us. And in fact, yes, I'm sure you heard from Marshall, um, we are expecting a record back to school season. Uh, it might come a little bit later because I think people have been a little tenuous about how things are going to play out. Um, but a third of U.S. parents plan to spend more uh, on 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 uh, back to school this year than they did last year. Uh, now, of course, last year was a little bit of an anomaly, but it's still more than um, than we saw in 2019, 18, 17. I don't know why I skipped 17 at the top of the slide, but 17 as well. Um, so we're we're expecting just a significant increase in expenditures among parents. Um, now we also expect uh, there to be a lot of online. Um, now notice there's kind of two dimensions happening here. One is um, the number of Americans who do some of their shopping online um, is is um, uh, is up. Uh, the percentage who's going to do all of their shopping online is down, right? Because last year you just couldn't shop in a physical store, but it's still a large number. Um, Thirteen percent of the U.S. parents say they're going to do all almost seventy-five to one hundred percent of their online their back to school shopping online this year, um, which is still up. Um, uh, it's, it's down from 18% last year, but twice what it was in 2019. So we're seeing something um, that looks a lot more like a surge toward the future than it look, than looks like pre-pandemic numbers. Um, so, and again, look, this is, you, you saw these numbers from Marshall, I'm sure. Um, we're already seeing this surge in spending online, uh, particularly in areas like clothes and accessories. We're seeing it in area, certainly on Amazon, a uh, huge boost, uh, um, huge climb in people who purchased um, clothes, shoes, or jewelry on, on Amazon between um, June and July. A lot of that had to do with Amazon Prime days, but of course, a lot of it just had to do with people having money and, and needs to spend in these categories. Um, and that pent-up demand isn't going away, even among the people who've already spent in the category. So we, we, we do these some kind of experimental survey questions where we ask people if they were given an extra $100, what, what, what one or two things would they spend it on? Um, the majority of Americans always say some sort of essentials, groceries, rent, whatever, eating out's the big popular thing, but notice that apparel and clothing, jewelry um, and accessories is third on that list. So there's still quite a bit of pent up demand to spend that money on, um, on a good rather than a service. We expected this big return of so-called experience spending. It has been happening, um, but it's also slowing as people get a little concerned about what the fall is going to look like. Um, one big trend that I just want to kind of finish on before we get to questions is um, we've seen certain things in the pandemic occur that will come and go. 
Um, and we've seen things that have accelerated beyond, um, that are going to accelerate way beyond the, 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 the pandemic. And, and it's really a movement towards digital and not just digital in general, but digital among older consumers. Um, the, they say, what is it? Um, necessity is the mother of invention, but I would say in this case, necessity was the mother of innovation. Um, Americans are, were forced to particularly Luddite older, um, less tech savvy Americans were kind of forced to adopt certain technical platforms that they had no choice other than to adopt. And, you know, this is one, this is just, this is just tracking the use of um, online grocery delivery and online grocery platforms among Americans 65 and older. Notice that between 2019 and today, it doubled, almost doubled. 9% uh, of that gain occurred in 2020, but it's still continuing to climb. It didn't fall back down just because people could go, feel com comfortable going back into the grocery store. What happened is these consumers said, wow, I thought that was going to be really difficult or it was going to be a clunky, awkward experience. And then they tried it and they were like, hey, that was actually pretty great and fairly convenient. And it's still safer than going back into a store. Uh, and that's here to stay, right? And so if we look at other categories, um, where we've seen a similar trend. I mean, let's start with like restaurant delivery apps. That's going to be your, um, you know, your DoorDash. It's the number of Americans, um, we'll, we'll just call baby boomers in this case, that um, that used a restaurant delivery app almost tripled since before the pandemic. Now it's four to 11%. So it's still a small group among that older age group, but still it's the acceleration pace is what we're going to look at. Mobile payment apps, PayPal, Venmo, uh, grew almost 50%, actually a little, you know, right around exactly 50% since the pandemic began. Um, so people are, are adopting new ways to spend. Uh, that has implications on banks, particularly physical retail banks, right? Uh, AI voice assistants, that's your Alexas and your um, your Google Homes, right? Uh, and even your Series, the, the, that's increased by about 40% in use among older Americans. And the huge one is telemedicine, uh, maybe not as relevant to this group, but we've watched um, Americans who who would never would have imagined a year, two years ago seeing what, going to the doctor on on a computer. Um, it's like what is that? It's like a thirteen hundred percent increase in the percentage of Americans over fifty five who've seen a doctor on a computer screen. And um, yeah, some of that will probably phase back a little bit, but a huge percentage of those Americans fully into, particularly in certain categories like normal checkups. Um, uh, various types of uh, visits that they like well visits that they might have. Um, they're much more likely to do those things on a computer. And, you know, again, it was sort of the kind of thing where the consumer said before, I'm never going to do that. It's a silly concept. And probably it's hard to do. They were intimidated by the idea. And now they've tried it and realized that not only was it easy and a pretty good experience, um, but it was obviously, you don't want to go into the doctor's office if you don't have to ever, because you're sitting around a bunch of people sneezing and coughing. And so why would you ever do that if you didn't have to? Uh, and so all that's to set up, um, oh, what happened here? Um, what's this, that's a weird thing, but, oh, excuse me. What we said here is um, when shopping online, how likely would you be to use virtual try-on technology to see how clothes look on your body before purchasing? I'm sure you're aware of some of these um, experiments different retailers are trying with. 38% of Americans say they are into the virtual try-on technology, which is a big number and it's actually higher. It's closer to 50% among women. Um, there's never been a better time than right now for innovation in retail. And uh, so if you're thinking about um, whether you can play in these games or whether you need to brace, brace yourselves for consumers expecting different experiences for the way that they shop, um, now is the time. And these are things are here to stay and they're only going to accelerate, accelerate going forward. So uh, those are the big trends that we are seeing today across the US consumer population. Um, hopefully, they are presented in a way that you can kind of relate them back to your business. I know there's such a diverse group of people involved in this in this great group, uh, so it's hard to kind of touch on all of them, but um, hopefully you can map some of these things. Hopefully you can relate to a lot of them personally. You're probably seeing them in your personal lives and your professional lives, but, but they're real and they're profound and they're accelerating, right? Um, and all of these things are affecting everything, and I'm sure they're affecting your business and your brand and your products uh, and your customer and your employee. Um, so I'm going to pause there. There's my email address at the bottom. Karen mentioned our weekly or my weekly uh, email that I do. If you'd like to sign up, feel free to just email me. We don't make it too easy to find. Uh, so I'm happy to just arrange for that personally. Uh, if there are some questions that you want to 
um, don't get to ask today or something you don't want to ask in front of a larger group, feel free to email me. I promise to respond. Um, there, we also have other newsletters and lo lots of studies that we publish. So I'm happy to share and can go into more detail on, on anything you might want to know. So I will pause there. And I know Karen was taking an inventory of questions. So um, I do. I have, uh, let's see, am I back on? Uh, first question I have is any thoughts, you mentioned back to school, but holiday this year and spending, are you uh, able to make any predictions? Uh, no, um, <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I mean, I'd love to, and I know lots of people will try. Um, there is just too big of a question mark over the next sort of 90 days. Um, look, I would bet, I would bet in a positive manner because this how this pent up household income um, is it's gonna it would take a lot to erode that. Um, I'm generally very bullish on on the holiday. Um, I don't want to step go as far. Prediction predictions a dangerous game, right? Because there's just so many unforeseeable things between now and then. Um, but by and large, I expect. I, I think the question for, about holiday. Let me let me put it differently. There will be potentially an unprecedented amount of money spent this holiday season, period. Where that's going to be spent is the question. Um, if we are back into some semblance of, you know, lockdowns or, you know, quarantine or whatever it might be, people are going to spend in some categories like electronics and home goods and such more than they're going to spend on things that they do outside of the home. Uh, we may continue to see high levels of expenditure and like hard um, hard lines in in outdoor equipment, outdoor apparel, recreational equipment, and so on. Um, so I guess the, the the easy lazy answer for me to give is we do expect holiday spending to be significantly higher this year um, or very high. I guess I would say the thing I'm a little bit uneasy making any predictions about is where what in what categories those the, that money will be spent. I would say if the implications of this Delta resurgence uh, either go away or sort of plateau at a, you know, a less severe level, um, I would feel very good about sort of the apparel and accessories category as a big spending category go come, come Christmas time or come Black Friday time, I guess. Okay, uh, next question. We've seen a lot of shortages in uh, certain product categories, whether it's automotive or, you know, just seems to be lack of inventory. How is the overall consumer sentiment on waiting, waiting for goods and, um, you know, the backup of goods? Well, they're crabby about it, obviously, but, but we don't, what we don't see is a, is a, is a shrink in demand. Um, even as I showed you that sort of group that says I still would purchase clothes if I had an extra hundred dollars. What people are saying is, I'm, I'm, I still need to buy. So, for example, we track uh, intent to purchase a new uh, pur purchase or uh, a new or used auto in the next 90 days. We've tracked that for a decade. Um, it's the highest we've ever seen it right now. It's up from 10% of Americans who say they're in the market to buy a car to 13%, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it's actually it's a 30% increase in auto buying intent, right now. They also know that they're running into high prices and can't find the cars that they want, right? So the intent is still there. They're just waiting to see the prices come down. We've, start, we've already started to see that in lumber. Uh, home improvement intent had declined in May and June because lumber prices were so high, people were just waiting. As soon as those lumber prices started going down, that, that intent and that behavior act, or that activity in the category started to climb again. So I think it's just a very fluid situation. Yes, the consumer's crabby about it, but it's not like, moving them out of the category. It's just, they're biding their time because the money just sits in the bank, they'll spend it later. And, and it doesn't look like that you, you don't run the risk of them spending that money somewhere else in the short term, because yeah, they're still gonna need those things whenever they, they can afford, whenever the price is such that they can justify buying it, if that makes sense. Great, um, okay. Is climate change and sustainability making a dent in consumer choices? Um, dense, interesting question. Um, I think it's affecting consumer choices among a certain group of consumers. Um, it's obviously still a fairly political topic as it should not be, but it is right. Um, consumers who are, um, environmentally conscious tend to shop that way. Um, consumers who are not don't, um, 
you know, that shouldn't, again, that's not like an earth shattering observation, but so let's, so what we would say is that there's a certain group of consumers, about 30% who shop explicitly for kind of environment, you know, explicitly to be environmentally conscious. So it's about a third. And yes, that number is up. Um, certainly if given the choice, we also see that with things like buying local produce at the grocery store, which whether that's supporting local or whether it's envir an environmental motion, uh, we don't exactly know. Um, but yeah, we do, we do see it affecting consumer behavior, um, particularly among that one third who you can probably all um, picture in your head. Great. Okay, next question. Uh, is there any new information on consumer added for attitudes towards pre-sale items? Uh, pre-sale, what do you mean? Sorry, again, I'm not an expert in this. What do you mean by pre-sale items? So like not like that aren't that, uh, that aren't that aren't on sale? Uh, pre-sale meaning not yet available. So I'm going to pay money to buy a dress that isn't going to ship for months or weeks. Um, oh yeah. We don't, you know, we don't, yes. yeah, I don't, I'm not sure we ask about that. I don't think, in fact, I, I'm certain, and I certainly don't know the answer if we do, I can, I'm happy to look into it and it might even be something worth studying. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. Um, I get my guess is it would have to probably vary by category. Like how, how, how badly do they need the dress, right? Is it for a wedding or right? Or, or is it something they're buying to return to the office in a couple months? But no, I'm, unfortunately I don't have a strong answer on that. I don't think it's something I've watched. Yeah. It's, it's funny. I've definitely noticed it more, um, you know, it, from, from stores that, uh, don't normally do it. I was looking at Saks, um, you know, Moto Operandi, stores like that that do it, but there's, it seems like there's a lot more product out there that you're buying in advance. Um, okay, next question. Do we expect any continued uptick in spending in the home decor category as we lead into the holidays? I know we saw a rise during as people began to work from home. Well, again, I think that goes back to the answer to my question a bit ago. I think it does depend a little bit. Um, I think if there's a sense of, you know, we're going to continue to work from home, our kids might still be doing school from home. Um, we're just going to be in the home. So that's number one. I think that could be, um, that, could, that could affect the degree to which that happens. Um, but the, re the answer I'm going to, the reason I'm going to give a fairly resounding yes to that increase is because of all of the new home purchases that are happening um, and the remodeling that's happened, right? So people tend to do the remodeling first and then the, the accoutrement next. Um, they tend to buy a home and they, of course, come in and bring all kinds of new stuff because most likely they bought a larger home. Um, people are moving away from their apartments in the city to homes in the suburbs, and that's going to just create more space. So, yeah, I'm very, very bullish on the home goods category. Regard, regardless of what happens with the pandemic in the next four months or so. Um, but I think it could even be, I would be even more bullish if, you know, unfortunately I don't want to root for this to happen, but I would be even more bullish if we have more sustained kind of quarantining or social distancing in the next four to six months. So John, how do you work with individual businesses or clients? How might a company engage with civic sciences if they wanted more insights on their own business? Um, well, we are, um, you know, we're a service company. So we have both what we call a syndicated business, which is um, all of this stuff that we, so I'm, of course, I'm showing you a, a very small tip of a very large iceberg today. Um, we do track hundreds of brands and we do track spending in all these different categories and so on and so on and so on. Um, I'm just giving you kind of the high level view of that today. So, so there's more what we would just call syndicated, which is all the data and reporting that we do um, that you'll have access to that you don't see in a report like this, but also we do custom work. So if you come and say, I'm curious to understand how this group of consumers feels about my particular category or my brand. And if it's not something that we track, we can go out and gather that data and report it back to you. Um, the reason we are um, differentiated, I guess, uh, compared to maybe other companies that do survey work is that we can look at all that data within the context of these larger things we study. So we marry that sort of custom research to our syndicated. So um, we have subscription services and various sort of flavors of engagements for different size and shapes of companies. So I would say that uh, first step would be to email that address you see at the bottom of the screen. 
Okay. And um, if anyone has any other questions, you could put them in the Q&A, you could put them in the chat, you can text them to me. We have uh, a great opportunity to get John. I think we have time for a couple more questions before we let him go here. Anybody? Okay. I must have been thorough. It's very thorough, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thank you so much for joining us and sharing. And if anyone needs John's contact, you of course can reach out to us. Uh, we recorded this session. It will be on uh, it will be on the accessoriescouncil.org website. And uh, we'll look forward to hopefully seeing you in person, John next year instead of a zoom call <laughs> here 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 yes I, hopefully yes sign, sign me up I'll, I'll be there if i if we can that would be wonderful thank you for having me karen thanks ever again everybody for the great questions and for your time today and uh, again please don't be shy if you have any follow-up questions or to sign up for any of our content thank you very much thanks hi everybody uh Thanks for hanging in with us. I am really excited to be able to introduce Felita Harris. Uh, Felita is an award-winning, recognized senior fashion executive. Her resume is amazing. She's worked for the who's who of companies from Donna Karen, Alexander Wang, Leela Rose. She's a co-founder of a company called Inform and a diversity inclusion expert. Felita, welcome. And thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much for having me. So I know you have assembled an amazing panel. And I was hoping though, because we'd love to get to um, learn more about you and, and you know your, your uh, work that we could talk for a few minutes before we bring your panel on. Sure, so, thank you. Would, would you mind just telling us a little bit about your background? And, um, you know, I, I gave everyone a little teaser, but love to hear from you how, uh, how your path came in the world of fashion. Sure. They, I think, you know, like many individuals in our industry, I started in retail um, on the sales floor with the great retailers of today, Neiman Marcus, Saks Fifth Avenue, and Nordstrom. Um, about 20 years ago, I transitioned to wholesale uh, with Donna Karen Collection after LVMH acquired the brand. It was an, a tremendous opportunity. Um, I spent 12 years there, ultimately becoming the senior vice president of global wholesale. Um, after Donna Karen was acquired, I joined uh, companies such as Leela Rose and Alexander Wang overseeing their uh, global wholesale business. And like you mentioned, I uh, co-founded a tech company called Inform. What, what I realized throughout my experience is that if we really wanted to move merchandise, we needed to educate frontline sales teams. Um, I think we're experiencing that today. Um, in my experience, you know, sending reps on the road through, you know, like the trunks, the morning meetings was quite antiquated and expen expensive. And so we developed technology that would enable brands to publish their lookbooks, um, their orders, and their social media feeds uh, through our app. So you were basically publishing this information in real time. Um, like many businesses during COVID, um, we were no exception. So we actually paused our app and we were waiting for the industry to rebound when stores were closing. Um, and that's where actually I got interested in diversity. You know, the social movement was happening, um, the election and all these interesting things and conversations were happening. And I helped to co-found a board called, uh, and a nonprofit called Raise Fashion. Um, we decided uh, that tackling this issue on diversity and fashion was really important. Um, so myself, along with some prominent members of the fashion community started Raise Fashion, uh, helping to support Black brands scale their business through wholesale. And what we realized uh, quickly was that these brands were marginalized and uh, needed some support, pro bono support. And 
I just became really excited about that. Um, one thing led to the other, um, and that transitioned me to a new career, which leverages all everything that I've learned. Um, and here I am. I'm now on the diversity side of the business um, and helping brands and now Harlem's Fashion Row with strategy and revenue pipelines. So, Felita, you received a certification in diversity and inclusion from Cornell. Can you tell us about that program and what it involved? Absolutely. So, you know, when I joined Ray's Fashion to help co-found the board, I realized that although I'd had all this experience as an executive and uh, a Black woman, I needed to really deeply understand the challenge we were solving. And so connecting with these brands, understanding and empathizing with their situation was really important. Um, and so at Cornell, they were teaching, um, you know, the strategies and how to build framework and solve the challenges uh, that our industry is facing. And so that's why I started the program, you know, retooling like many individuals were doing during um, COVID. And, and it's really, it was an amazing experience. So, I mean, it's tough because the fashion industry isn't as diverse as it could be. How are you continuing that conversation and why is it so important um, to continue that conversation? Yeah, great question. I think it's important because when you really look at it, everyone has history. Everyone comes from a different walk of life um, that, spread, that spans centuries. So this is not an issue I'm learning that we can solve overnight. Um, the discussion must continue and we must understand how we can all work together to find solutions. Um, you know, Karen, there is a fear of diversity fatigue. Um, many, I, I'm in many rooms where this conversation is like, you know, are we going to lose traction? Uh, will anyone care in another year? And so we must continue to have these conversations, talk about it, bridge the gap, if you will, um, because our industry is built on innovation, right? And so we have to celebrate all visionaries in order to move forward, right? We, we need to embrace the principle that um, the back of visionaries is how and why our industry exists and that that principle should exist for all. So where do you think there are gaps? You know, I go to the schools and I see a sea of diversity. And yet when you get to the boardrooms, not so much. So how can we as an industry, how can we as individual companies nurture and help grow the, the next generation of leadership and assure that the the, the faces and the complexion of our employees match who we're selling to? Another great question. And I think, you know, what's, what's great about the panel um, that we've assembled today is that they are all individually uh, qualified. They've done the work, right? They are super qualified in their careers and, and, you know, not only in the fashion industry, but others to tackle this challenge. I have my own perspective on that. I think it starts you know, with internships, I think it starts at the managerial level, and I think it starts with senior level management um, really requiring that um, talent and talent and, and recruitment happens full stop. Um, but I do think education is important. You know, if you if you don't really have that understanding at home and you weren't really raised with that mentality, how do you implement that at work? So I think it happens on, on both sides uh, with the education. You know, that's why DEI training is so important, but also strategy. You know, how are we implementing this work in our business strategies? So what you will hear from our panel today are strategies on how we can move forward, why it's important, um, not only from a conversation, but how we can implement these strategies in our business um, I think it will be really exciting and we can sort of start to pull back um, some of the, quest the questions and strategies, strategies on how to move forward. Yeah, so Felita, I, 
questions are already starting to come in, but I think uh -oh, they might- wait, wait for the panel, wait for the panel. <laughs> There's a good one. I was gonna say, I think oh, we might I see, want to- I see, I see the panel, the, the qualified guest in the room. <laughs> uh, exactly, because if not, you are on the hot seat all by yourself. Uh, you started by hot seat early. <laughs> <laughs> so your panel is a super impressive group. Why did you pick the women that you, you have selected and let's introduce them and bring them out because I can't wait to meet everyone. Sure, well, you know, like I was saying, I chose these women because I, I've worked with some of them or I know individuals that have been impacted by their work. These women are really, among, among others, are making change in our industry. So it's important to hear what, what they have to say. And, and I know that everyone will be changed uh, by this conversation and I'm excited to get started, Karen. Excellent. So let me, um, let me pull up, let's see, here we go. So we're gonna introduce your amazing group. There they are. So do you want to uh, bring them on one by one? We can bring them all on and uh, you tell me when and I'll Ladies, get started. Come on out. <laughs> Hello. Hi, lady. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. It's so amazing to see all of you. Hey there. Hi. Hi, Amber. Good to see you, Brandon. It's long time. Oh, I'm loving this blonde hair. Thank you. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, well, thank you, first of all. Uh, thank, thank you to everyone for joining this conversation. I am thrilled to introduce our incredible panel. Uh, Brandis Daniel, founder, and CEO of Harlem's Fashion Row and Icon 360. We have Amber Cabral, founder and CEO of Cabral & Co, and author of Allies and Advocates, Creating an Inclusive and Equitable Culture, and Melissa Carter, founder of Cameo Vintage. Ladies, thank you for joining us today. This conversation is so necessary and we must continue to have it. So we appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me. Likewise, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So the audience would love to hear more about your amazing companies and how they address diversity and inclusion in the fashion industry. Brandis, everyone, everyone is inspired by what you built with Harlem's Fashion Row. And last year you launched Icon 360, a nonprofit arm of your business. Tell us how they both address diversity and inclusion in the fashion industry. Awesome, thank you so much, Valida. So Harlem's Fashion Row was started 14 years ago. We're actually celebrating our 14th year um, in August. And our goal with Harlem's Fashion Row, we act as a bridge between retailers and designers of color. And we do that through brand collaborations, um, experiential events, pipeline programs, and brand strategy. And we've been able to do some incredible collaborations. We work, our first collaboration was actually with Nike and LeBron James. We had three black female designers work on his 16th shoe, uh, which sold out in five minutes. Then we partnered with um, Kidswear brand, Jamie and Jack on another collaboration last fall that we released. And that was actually their site, second highest selling holiday collection ever. Um, we have an exciting collaboration coming up this year with Banana Republic and Charles Harbison, and we have a few more that we will be um, announcing this fall as well. And then last year at the top of the pandemic, I knew that I would start a nonprofit in the decade. As a matter of fact, I got my family together and I said, I don't really feel like we should make goals for 2020, but let's make decade goals. So I had these decade planning parties with my nieces and nephews and parents. <laughs> And one of the things on my list was that I would start a nonprofit in the decade and that that nonprofit would provide designers of color in HBCU fashion departments with financial resources. Well, then the pandemic hit 
and designers were calling me and saying, Brandis, our business went from making, you know, $20,000 a month to $20 a month. It was such a drastic change and they didn't know if they were going to make it. And so I said, you know what? I got to start this nonprofit now. We have to raise money for them now. And so we did an event um, online. I think it was in May of last year. And we had over a thousand people show up and donate money to these designers. We were able to raise about $15,000 um, for designers of color. And then a month later, we got a note, an email, a phone call from Vogue and the CFDA where they donated a million dollars to our nonprofit. And that opened the door for us to give 27 Black designers um, funding for last year. And this year, we've been able to get out, give out a half a million dollars to HBCU fashion departments, um, thanks to a partnership with Gap Inc. So it's been an incredible um, journey, and I'm excited to grow both our nonprofit and our um, for-profit company. That is incredible, incredible. Thank you for all that, that just the support and the work. Um, really impressive. And Amber, you were formerly a diversity strategist for some of the biggest companies in the world. Tell us why you started Cabral & Co. and what inspired you to write Allies and Advocates? So thanks again for inviting me to participate in this panel. Um, I, I did do diversity strategy for some big companies. I used to work for Walmart before actually stepping out and starting Cabral Co. And honestly, I started it because I felt like the thing that was holding companies up was kind of, was kind of, um, it was largely this experience of, I have a good idea where I want to go in terms of diversity, but I don't have a good path to get there, or I'm not sure what kind of partners I need to get there, or what if I say the wrong thing when I'm asking for help? And so what would happen is people would ultimately do nothing because they were unsure like what the right step was. And because I was solving that problem internally, working for an organization, it felt very accessible for me to be able to solve it working outside of an organization and supporting the companies that were looking for that kind of work. And so that's really why I founded the company to try to help organizations to actually move the needle on inclusion, to actually be purposeful about what diversity means for them as an organization and how they include the diversity that they are able to attract and retain. And so um, I've just, I've been doing that ever since. I love it. It matters a lot to me. Um, it's taken me into a lot of worlds and realms and experiences, including fashion that I don't know a whole lot about, but I am very excited to be able to lean into and um, help people understand the value of being inclusive in spaces that um, typically, you know, are not necessarily going to be the most inclusive just by nature. We like to think that, you know, inclusion just happens and it doesn't. We got to do a little bit of work to make it happen. And so I, I'm just excited to be able to help organizations that are literally genuinely interested in are bravely leaning into these conversations to actually see some of this stuff come to life. So that's, that's why I founded the company. Now, why I wrote Allies and Advocates, I kept getting the same questions. Um, Allies and Advocates was kind of the product of, you know, to be very candid, you know, the murder of George Floyd. I feel like there were a lot of conversations happening around what allyship was, how to do it, what does it mean um, to be an ally, what actions do I need to take. Um, there was a lot of online chatter, and um, I actually had the opportunity to work with Wiley Publishing to put out a book on the subject and have been teaching classes on it. And so um, I really put it out to give people some direction around when you say you are an ally, what does that mean? When you say you want to be an advocate, what actions does that mean that you are taking? And I wanted it to be digestible and simple and something that people could pick up, you know, read in a weekend, maybe, you know, two, if you've got life happening, as many of us do, um, and be able to walk away with some actionable tactics, you know, that you could literally apply in your day to day without your supervisors of, you know, input or, you know, your spouse or your children, you could literally on your own, just kind of jump in and actually take action on. And so the book was intended to provide that. I love your book because I, it addresses several things. One, COVID, I think yes. that it's a level set in what we've all experienced. I love uh, the timeline, the historical timeline, which grounds us all in the history. And I love how you um, move it forward with what true allyship and advocacy really is. And so I think it is a book for everyone. Everyone must get this book. When you get off this Zoom, get the, it's right behind her, actually. 
It's right. Uh, that book, that yellow book, that it's is right the book. Here? The book. <laughs> it, yeah, and you can read it in a weekend because it is that engaging. But I, I do, I think you did a brilliant job um, with writing the book and educating everyone on what it really means to move this conversation forward. Thank and you. Melissa. After hi, guys. Decades, <laughs> hi. hi. Um, Melissa, after decades in luxury retailing, you decided to launch Cameo Vintage during the pandemic. Tell us about your passion for upcycling and why your business is important to diversity in the fashion. Um, so, yeah, you know, COVID was a lot. And I guess I did lose my job during um, the pandemic. And I immediately knew that I wanted to pivot in, into sustainable fashion. Um, before I even before COVID even happened, I was designing a logo of a iconic, I call her the iconic cameo woman, because I felt just um, being a recruiter in the luxury marketplace, I didn't really thought that the talent saw themselves in corporate roles. So after I lost my job, I wanted to continue to do the work and to not only show that you can see yourselves in fashion, but also see yourself in a celebrated graphic like the cameo so i love sustainability i love recycled and pre-loved fashion but i thought to myself what would separate me from another person selling vintage clothes and i think what separates me is the constant reminder of the cameo when i upcycle it on each piece is a reminder to not only to celebrate the black woman but also to celebrate her no matter what you look like because I think that is true allyship. I think as people of color, we always go to, oh, it's cultural appropriation. And I do think that, you know, in some brands that has happened, but for my specific brand, it is, this is not just a black thing. I think as people of color, we need to allow people who don't look like us celebrate us um, instead of always seeing it as trauma. Yeah, your Friday night style live was really, uh, I mean, just really a celebration of fashion. And I love your intersection of upcycling and you made it really exciting to shop during a hard time to really yes. even sort of move forward in a pandemic. So congratulations on your pivot forward um, mm -hmm. and probably what was a difficult time for many, many people. Um, yes. We're gonna get into some of that in, in a few minutes. Um, Brandis, you started Harlem's Fashion Row 14 years ago, understanding the significance of amplifying and celebrating Black talent. My question is, over the last year, what are some of the biggest changes you've seen, and is it enough? Such a great question, Felita. Um, when I first started Harlem's Fashion Row, I didn't actually understand the challenge that existed in this industry. You know, I call myself a proud outsider because I am. I'm from Memphis. I don't come from some of the luxury brands that a lot of people in fashion come from. And so I thought, oh, I just don't know. It's not that there is, you know, very few Black designers. I just don't know who they are. Well, that actually sent me down a rabbit hole of research. And so I found, you know, this woman, Lois Alexander Lane, who started the Black Fashion Museum and Harlem Institute of Fashion. I discovered that Black people have been around in fashion for a very long time. In fact, we created the machinery that made the shoe from start to finish, which took production from 50 shoes to 700 shoes. We also invented the, um, the, the, the dryer, the clothes, the, the automatic dryer for your clothes. Uh, we invented the, the ironing board, you know, Abraham Lincoln's wife wore um, uh, designs from Elizabeth Keckley. So our history was so rich that I didn't know it. And as I started to research, I realized that as I was looking down department stores websites, that less than 1% of designers that were sold on these stores websites were designers of color. So that meant I took about two years and did nothing but research. And then I said, well, maybe we don't spend that much money on clothes. Let me go see. So I went and looked and I realized, oh no, in 2007, we were spending over $22 billion a year on apparel and apparel products. So there's a huge disparity there, right? If we're spending $22 billion a year on apparel, we're representing less than 1% of designers sold in major department stores. And so that was really the premise of what 
um, centered me in terms of my purpose for continuing on with Harlem's Fashion Row. I have been for the past 14 years, you know, talking to brands. We've gotten lots of great press, but I have to tell you, it wasn't until 2018, which was after our 10th year business, that one major brand decided to really take notice of the work we had been doing, and that was Nike. And that partnership opened doors for us to have other brand partnerships. So really, our pivot started in, in 2018. So when in 2020, when the death of George Floyd happened, and um, I mean, I don't even, I was probably having, I don't know, 10 brand calls a day, no exaggeration. Um, that was a big difference for us. It was all of a sudden, you know, we were getting all these inbound calls of, okay, what do we do? We, we just looked around, Brandis, and we realized we don't have one Black designer in our design room. Or we just looked around and I just realized I thought my leadership was really diverse and I've got, you know, lots of ethnicities, but no black person. Is that a problem? And those were the real conversations that I started to have. And the shift for us was that for the first time, I was able to actually have honest conversations. And before we'd have to kind of dance around it, I had to figure out how do I present this um, because no one wanted to talk about race. And for the first time last year, everyone wanted to talk about race. And it was fantastic because I had been wanting to talk about it for, at that time, 13 years. Um, so it, it allowed us to have very honest conversation. And it's so hard to push things forward when you're not willing to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. So being able to talk to CEOs of huge companies or talk to executives of companies and say, where are you right now? If this is between us. These are closed door conversations and have them be vulnerable enough and feel comfortable enough to really tell me the truth. And then for me to say, okay, here's what we have. I think that these could solve some of your challenges. Um, so for us, it really, you know, opened so many doors, but the biggest door I think was for us to finally have very honest and transparent conversations with, which allowed us to move forward in a big way. That's that's uh, really eye opening. We were having a conversation prior about, you know, what's next and how do you move this forward from a conversation to action. And Amber, I would love for you to chime in on uh, what Brandis just said about the conversation, because I know you work internally a lot. What do you think it takes to advance this conversation to action to actually hiring and diversifying teams? I get asked, I think, three times a day. <laughs> um, so I appreciate you asking that. Um, it really depends. You know, the, the main thing, though, that it takes is the willingness to actually take a step. Lots of folks right now are at the point where they want to talk about it. Like, we want to talk about the thing. We want to have some conversation about the stuff. I've seen this on my Facebook or this is going across my social media or my kids coming home talking about or whatever. Like, lots of folks are doing that. But not a lot of folks are like actually challenging, like asking the tough questions, like saying what needs to be said to their leaders. Like, you know, th that's where the bumpiness really kind of starts to percolate at this point. Like, we, you know, we had this, you know, to Brandis's point, like, you know, this incredible influx of like dialogue, like after George Floyd's murder, it was just this, you know, unfortunate, terrible, but like incredibly eye-opening event that caused everyone to say, wait, we gotta talk about it. But the action isn't in the talking, it really isn't. And so to me, you know, if I were to just kind of do a lay of the land and an observation of, you know, thinking about my own clients, thinking about the conversations that we have the most often, it's moving beyond that. It's being able to say, okay, what is the thing that I need to do? Where is the place that I put my dollars? You know, it's those things. And a lot of folks are, you know, still really personalizing a conversation that is not personal. Inclusion isn't really about you. Inclusion is about how you show up. And so in the spaces that I insert myself into, in the spaces that I am invited to, how am I making that an inclusive space? Yeah, I'm going to show up with my, you know, uniqueness and my diversity and my identity and my characteristics and my conversation. 
but how am I also making room for yours? And if we all just take a little bit of that responsibility, then suddenly the labor is happening, right? And it's not labor that rests on one particular identity. It's not labor that rests on just, you know, black people. It's labor that rests on all of us so that inclusion can happen. And th those dialogues can start to turn into, oh, I need help with. Here's where I need your dollars. Here is who I can connect you to. And so it's, you know, it, it can be conversation, but it has to be a bit more purposeful than it is right now. Um, and it has to move beyond just the idea of, oh, I'm trying to educate myself. I hear that so much. Oh, I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to educate myself. We got to be willing to get past the, that part and be willing to like step in it a little bit, you know, and know that when you step in it, you can rinse your shoes off and you can keep moving if you make a mistake um, and know how to do that. And so, you know, part of what Allies and Advocates was intended to do was some of that, give people the language to know, what do I do if I step in it? How do I apologize? How do I navigate that? Because that's really where the meaningful impact in, in what any, in anything, in all of the work all of us are doing, whether it's in fashion or in the world, it, it really is you getting into the uncomfortable space. And once you get into the uncomfortable space and you start to have those conversations in that space, that's where the, the meatiness happens that can start to make the change because people start to hear things they haven't heard before. And so I think that's really what we need more of, um, which is why I love what Harlem's Fashion Row is doing. And I, I really think it's super important that we are focused on looking around to say, who's not here? Whose voice am I not hearing? How can I put myself in the position where I can hear that voice? How can I invite that voice to the table? How can I create an environment where they want to be here? Which means I got to figure out how I can be more inclusive, right? And so that's the work of inclusion that I try to teach. Not just, I mean, I want you to know the definitions, like what's diversity, what's inclusion, what's allyship. I want you to know that. But I more so want you to show up and say, ooh, what's my obligation to this space that I'm in? And so I think when we start to get more people doing that, then we'll start to see more action in terms of impact. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to switch gears for a minute. Uh, Melissa, Cameo Vintage has leveraged live streaming to successfully reach and engage a diverse consumer base. There has been a major focus on retailers carrying diverse brands and working with diverse vendors. How do you think this will change business and the consumer's perspective on buying from Black and Brown de uh, designers? You know what? Um, I really interestingly enough, when I started the Friday Night Style Live and live selling, um, you know, I I thought, you know, at first I didn't know what I was doing. Let me be honest. I was just like, let me do this and let me see who shows up. But what I've started to see is that um, people are col of color are more aware of who's hosting, hiring, and who you're collaborating with. And I think before it was harder to ask those questions. I think before, if there was one of us in the room, we were happy just to be in the room um, and not necessarily, you know, paying it forward. Um, I do now we are, this is the time where uh, black designers and black creatives are holding brands accountable um, to their moral obligation. Whereas before, again, when it was one of us, it's like, yippee, it's just one. But now we are, um, now that brand trust is at stake and we are really kind of honing in on who's in the room and who's not much like how Brandis was speaking of, I think it gives us, um, a level of validity. And I think it gives us a level of, um, it, ch it changes our passion. Our, you know, I know for me, you know, yes, I'm happy doing what I'm doing. Um, yes, I'm happy to be on the forefront of sustainability, but now it really, you know, what separates me is that I'm able to put an Afro logo on my uh, vintage clothing and not ask for forgiveness, but challenge you into why you're not wearing it. Or the conversation comes across when people, I, you know, I'm in Winneka, Illinois, which is an extremely um, high potential, you know, vastly white neighborhood. Their question then becomes, can I wear this? And then the question further says, then we start talking about diversity and inclusion and the importance of you wearing it. So for me, because I'm no longer in the corporate space, no, I can't advocate in a corporate sector. But I do feel since I am on the front lines and since I am in a high potential neighborhood that lacks blackness, what I can do is advocate for my blackness so that you too, 
where you are in your corporate headquarters can wear the shirt with pride and also be more inclusive. That's, a, that's, that's fantastic. And I know, you know, you shared with me uh, when we met that you were really surprised at how diverse your consumer base act in actuality was. You were like, Felita, like I have Sa not Sally down the street. Yeah. yeah. They were I do rocking have Sally. Yes. Yeah, I, I know you have Sally. But like <laughs> rocking the tea down the street, you were surprised at that. Tell us about that experience and what you know you what? Hope used to happen for other brands. I was surprised at it because I think. You know, in the beginning, when I was creating this logo, I actually create, created this with a first uh, generation Russian woman who graduated from FIT. So, and she's not black. She's a white uh, woman who is, is an amazing graphic artist. When I first created this logo, I was saying to her, you know, don't you think it's important to put a white woman and black woman together to show unity? And she said, you know, I don't think that it's necessary. And I think that, you know, you're forcing diversity where, you know, if your clients aren't going to purchase this based off what this is, looks like, you know, we don't look alike and yet we're carrying the same flag and we know that it's extremely important. So I still was on the fence, but when I opened up my pop-up shop and I sold out of totes the first week and none of my customers were black, it made me think um, think of hope. And it made me say to myself that, you know, I think the work is being done. And I think, you know, where I thought of the logo as being, you know, supremely black, celebrating black life, black culture. I think the people in the neighborhood and the white women who carry it think the same thing. And I also think, you know, for me seeing it is I finally get to see myself. You know, growing up, I never saw myself on clothing. And if I did, I saw an exaggerated version of a black woman or a mammy. And in this case, I'm able to see a iconic Afro woman with an Afro and she's a vintage girl. And that's never was a thing. That never was a thing. So um, I think my first black experience was with Shawnee dolls and that was you know, a, a, a collection of dolls made by Mattel in like the late eighties. And by that time I was about nine or 10. So I think this gives people the opportunity to not only ask the questions, but also to continue to support, um, support beauty in many different facets, which is what, which, which is what surprised me. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so my last two questions are for the panel and we'll start with Brandis. Um, there is a fear of diversity fatigue happening, that the fashion industry will lose interest in tackling this issue. Um, tell us why it's important for retailers and brands to create healthy work environments, jobs, economic opportunities for Black and diverse designers in the fashion industry. Yeah. Um, I mentioned earlier Lois Alexander Lane and I have her book right here by me. And in her book that was written in 1978, she says, um, we look forward to the day when there will be a major design house on Fashion Avenue with an owner whose skin is black, but whose merchandise is universal. It should come in the eighties. And so when you read a book like this that was written in the seventies, who says she's hoping that these conversations are over in the eighties, it means that this conversation is cyclical and that it happens, this happens over time through history. So how do we make sure that this is our last time having this conversation, right? And that's where I am. I am at a place where I wanna make sure that this is our last time having this conversation. So for Icon360, our nonprofit, we're building out an endowment in perpetuity for other brands for Harlem's Fashion Row, the conversation is how do we create a three-year plan, a five-year plan, a 10-year plan so that we can be sure that we don't have to make sure that the right person is in place every year who sees this as a priority. And even as I was having conversations with major leaders from you know, the CFDA to large publishing houses, the conversation was, what's the commitment? Are you at least making a 10-year commitment? Because 
without that, the fear is because history has shown us this book, what I just read, that this is something that comes and goes. It comes and goes. Um, there is someone in the fashion industry who's been in there for a long time, super well respected. And she always says to me, she said, Brandis, Black people were in fashion now. You better get do what you're going to do. And we should never have to yep. think that we're in fashion now because we don't know what's going to happen later. And Felita, that's not built on, um, you know, being um, being negative or pessimistic. That's literally built on facts, facts of, of what's happened in this industry over the course of time. So as a, as a retailer, as a company, you have to be the one that say, this is the commitment that we're making and we're gonna make this over the next decade, you know, or we're gonna make this commitment through 2025 and we're gonna measure where we are. And if we're not at a place where we, where we think we should be, here is our next step. Because there is no retailer on the face of the earth that goes out and says to their executives, hey, go and make better sales. No, we're saying we want, you know, a 10% comp over last year, or we want to hit, we're very specific in our goals and our sales goal. And the same has to be true now for diversity. Well said. And I'd like to just chime in just um, on an individual level, just because I recognize that like not everybody has the influence that Brandis is talking about. Although I love when I get those moments where I can get that commitment. I am here for it. I am trying to force you to put the pen to paper and like put it on your website and all that because I can hold you accountable to the thing you said you're going to do. But for everybody that's like in the position where you are working for companies that are making these commitments or struggling to make these commitments, the thing that's really important for you to do is continue to have the conversation. Continue to be the voice in the room that asks the tough question. Continue to be the one that's willing to say black and not BIPOC. Continue to be the person in the room that is willing to actually push the dialogue and say the thing. Because if we stop, we slip into that respectability politics thing and then we don't have the conversation anymore. It goes back to being normal to say, ooh, can I say this in this meeting? Wait, what leader can I talk to about that? Because I don't know if. And we're in a really critical time right now where folks are listening. So I'm going to keep talking. And as much as I can get folks to talk, as much as I can talk, as much as I can encourage people to actually do some talking, the less likely we're going to slip back into a place where we cannot say the things. And so while we are holding out on that pressure and getting those leaders to sign those commitments and make those dollar specific numerical digit, <laughs> you know, uh, aggressive goals, we have to be really committed to actually holding the conversations, to asking the questions, to doing the things. And that's not just a Black person's responsibility, that's everybody. Because at the end of the day, like diversity isn't just Black folks, right? It's, you know, LGBTQ folks, it's folks that are disabled, it's women, it's, you know, it's age, it's all of those things. And so when you are thinking to yourself, like, oh my gosh, this isn't me, then that's probably the place where you can be an ally and still speak up. And so I want us to recognize even if we aren't the person that makes the commitment, we can still be the person that helps to drive the commitment forward by being unwilling and relentless about continuing to have the dialogue. Fantastic. Um, Melissa, do you have uh, something you want to chime in with that? And these, <laughs> I mean, they have spanned. <laughs> yeah, you know, I just think it's just, I, you know, it's, it's well said. Again, I'm not in the corporate sector anymore but I do feel you know when people buy my shorts shirts or my guests buy my shirts and guests buy my vintage um you know I have been in conversations with you know people who run companies in in my showroom and saying you know I love these t-shirts how do I get um mm -hmm. you know my company has efforts of trying to get more black talent do you know anyone do you <laughs> how do I do this um I think um, to both both ladies' points that it's very necessary to hold corporations and even your friends responsible who are not black. Um, I think also having a, a DNI objective and having having that a written objective, just like you know you want to copy your numbers and everything else, there should be an objective that you are showing to your 
team internally so that they can see that the needle is trying to, uh, you are trying to move the needle in diversity. So I agree with every single piece of that. And again, it goes back to the inspiration of, of my shirts and brand is to have that conversation and allow them kind of that funk, you know, that you know, kids play with fidgets and they have these things that remind them the shirt, the pin is to remind them that we exist and we don't see ourselves. So I, I do strongly believe in both, both of what you both have, have said for sure. Thank you. And my last question and audience, please put, start putting your questions in the chat. Um, there are companies that have not created a DEI strategy. Um, and, yeah. and to your point, Amber, that spans race. That is across every DEI, uh, that's across the spectrum. So if this is the case, what steps should they take to ensure that a strategy is being implemented? And Amber, we'll start with you. First of all, get some help. <laughs> like, let's, let's just be very honest. Like, I think that businesses do a great job of strategizing about business. I don't think that we understand that like we're in business because of people and we don't do good with people. We do good at like, let me sell the thing, but we don't necessarily do a good job of like, who am I selling it to? What do I want them to feel like? How am I making sure I'm creating that impact? Right. And so hire someone, like reach out, find someone like me or someone else that does this work that has exposure across different industries, or at least really meaningful in, you know, exposure in the industry that you work in so that you can get some support around like, what is even building a strategy around this mean? How do I need to think about it? That's the first thing I think any and every organization that's serious about this can do. And here's the thing, everybody likes to think they can do it in house but you're talking to yourself. You're speaking in your little bubbles. <laughs> you're talking in your own little safe corporate speak. And ultimately you're not gonna be able to move it forward because there are things that when you bring someone from outside in, they're gonna be able to say that you will not otherwise even hear, all right? And so that's really critical. The other thing is if you are in the position where you're not sure that it's important, I want you to take a hard look at what sales look like. Take a hard look at who's buying your stuff. Take a hard look at who you're hiring. Take a hard look at who you are interested in attracting. And what you will find there is the very diversity that you are probably pretending you don't see. And so I think if we spend a bit of effort recognizing just how integrated into people and humanity and identity work, life, fashion, and all of those things really are, we do a lot better job saying, oh my gosh, we are really excluding this whole swath of folks. What do I need to do to be better at that? And that's where the, you know, that's where the real like, oh my gosh, I'm sold. I need to do the work part comes in. When I join an organization brand new um, that ask, asks us to come in and do work for them, that's where we start. Like, who are you serving? And, you know, a lot of times it's our customers. I'm like, okay, but who are those folks? Like, let's get real about those identities. And like, once you can start to have the conversations about like the diversity among us, the identities among us, well, now all of a sudden people are starting to think like, oh wait, those dollars, those dollars hit those communities that you feel unsafe driving through. Those dollars hit those communities that you don't necessarily want to talk publicly about. And so now you need to think about it, right? And you think about what the talent looks like there, what it's going to look like to attract people that live in those communities, because that's going to help your dollars. And so I try to remind people of that at the very beginning, because it's usually going to help to get that strategy going. But the number one thing you want to do is get some outside perspective, because otherwise it's an echo chamber and you're not going to be able to move forward. I love that so much. And I know Brandis at Harlem's Fashion Row, you have, you mentioned four pipeline pillars to also help um, with, you know, what Amber was saying, the commercial aspect of the business. And so do you, do you want to also chime in on that question? Yeah, sometimes we are working with brands for the first time and they will say to us, Brandis, we love what you're doing with Harlem's Fashion World. We don't know where to start. And I'll say, you know what, have a dinner. Let's do a dinner with you designers. Let's, let's start there. Or come be a partner for the next event that we're going to have. It's super turnkey, start there. What I've noticed is once a person takes a step, that step leads to, we've had a company who said to us, we don't know what we want to do. This was two years ago. And they said, we don't know what we want to do. I said, why don't you just come on, host a cocktail hour for these designers? That's it. Easy, right? 
that one thing has led to now a multi-year partnership. We have probably four things happening with them from pipeline programs with HBCUs to um, they're hosting events for designers that will help them bring in more diverse talent, black designers into their organization. We're doing collaborations with their brands now as well um, that have been incredibly successful. So just take a step. Amber talked about bringing in outside perspective. I think she's absolutely right. And then that next step is talking to someone that will allow you to save space to just take one step. Um, and so that has been really successful for us. Felita is just saying, start here. And then you don't even need to know what the next step is going to be. But I know that once a brand takes one step, they're like, ah, because it opens them up and it brings them into a space that they don't really know exist. And that opens them up to take the next step. Um, and that's how it's worked out for us. And when Amber talked about, you know, having diverse talent in your organization or Sometimes you're talking to each other. And so the conversation isn't push, being pushed forward. I saw Devin Carter put in the comments that how do you make your culture a place for diverse, that diverse talent wants to stay? And they're so right about that. We had a situation recently where we had HBCU students in an organization and someone was saying that the student was showing up too proper and that they weren't showing up being their authentic selves. And we had to have a conversation. And I said, you know, that student has been taught to code switch since they were little because yeah. they had to code switch. Not yeah. because it was, it was because that was how they had to show up. And that's how we've had to show up for so many years. We've not been able to come into doors. People haven't said to us, come in as you are. <laughs> that's only happened in the last year, mm -hmm. you know, up until last year. All we've known is if you want to go into a corporate, corporate setting as a Black person, you got to be ready to code switch. So this mm. person was doing what all of us have done, right? And so, um, and, but she was being actually punished for it and didn't know it. And so me having that conversation with the executive and saying, wait a minute, it's not that she's showing us, it's not that she doesn't want to show up as herself. She doesn't think that she can. Right. And that dialogue alone was so eye-opening for me, quite honestly, because I was like, oh my goodness, I didn't know that these students would get punished for being too formal. And also for the organization, because they said, oh my goodness, we, we didn't have anyone in our, in our organization to tell us this. Thank you for telling us this. So they were really grateful. So those are the things that happen when you bring someone in from the outside and also when you start to take at least one step. At least one. I would love to squeeze a little tiny Amber. line. In. <laughs> I saw your face, Amber. Squeeze it, Amber. It was just like leaping out of me. I can't help it. So the, I can't, the teacher in me is like ready. So two things. I love the story you share, Brandon. It's, it's so, it's, it's very common and it's so true. Like people show up in a workspace because they have been told this is how you show up for work. There's two things I think that are really useful for the audience we have here that we can all take back and use. Um, the first one is show yourself, please show yourself because we imitate each other. And so I have a lot of folks that are like still code switching in the workplace. And I'm like, listen, bring you, it can be a little bit, look, I'm a lapel pin wearer, right? It could be that bring some you to the place. Like if you can bring a little bit of you, you are, you have no idea how impactful that messaging is and how much it invites someone to bring them. And the more of us that we bring, the more opportunity we have to invite folks to be like, oh, I need to adjust a little bit. There's a little bit more here. I can include that. <laughs> all right. And so we want to see that happen. The second thing I wanted to say, just to kind of like piggyback on what Brandis was saying, folks don't know. If you don't know and you're afraid you don't know, and maybe you're making a judgment because you don't know, I have one question for you. You can put in your pocket. You can always use. You can ask it in a group. You can ask it individually. How can I make this space safe for you? Mm. Ask the question. We often say, this is a safe space. No, no, honey. It's safe for you. Mm. How can I make this space safe for you? Find the opportunity to ask that question. You may not get an answer in the group. You may only get it one-on-one, -on -one, but ask the question because people will tell you, I don't think I can, and here's why. And that will give you the chance to make the adjustments necessary so that I can show up in my lapel pins or in my fun haircut or in my funky style or whatever, but I won't know I can do that until someone's willing to at least just say like, how can I do that so that you are able to show up here? And that's it. And I'll be quiet. <laughs> now, listen, we could we could talk all day 
long. And what we, what I want to say is thank you. Thank you for the work. Thank you for the love and thank you for the investment in not only the black community, but many, you've been doing this work for our industry. Um, so thank you. Uh, we have questions. We've had questions before the panel started. So <laughs> Karen, I'm going to turn it back over to you for Q&A. Absolutely. Thank you so much, ladies. I am, uh, there's been comments, everything from we'd like to see some of your statements notarized to, um, you know, just thank you and congratulations for uh, continuing the topic. I have a couple questions. Uh, and before, before we're done, we have a few minutes just how to get in touch with you all. I know, uh, Fleeta, you were putting some of the comments into, or some of that information into the comments, but I know that our teams would, um, would love to be in touch. So the questions that came early, the questions that came during, um, and I know, you know some of them were answered, but really it's about um, diversity with black, size, the first question we got had to do with age, um, you know, discrimination against age and really creating an environment that's friendly for, for all. So um, I know that's not exactly phrased as a question, but what might an employer do to really um, start a program if, you know, if they're not already doing it or, you know, if they want to fortify what they're already doing. So there's a couple things. The first thing, you know, the first thing is to recognize that like, you're not going to solve it with a program. <laughs> like we have to realize first that when we get to the place of like, what's the right program, a lot of times what we're ultimately doing is trying to fix the people instead of the problem. So if you're at the point where you're saying like, oh, we need a mentoring program or we need a women's development program, like maybe, but like take a step before that and say, okay, but what are we solving for? And what it could really be is, oh, wait, the folks that are in this leadership role and the talent that we want to get there, they don't speak the same language. That is the program you want to create. That's not necessarily a program that's for like women or a program that's for LGBTQ folks. That may be a program that's about communication. And so thinking really critically about what the problem is, addressing in that space is where you really want to start when you're thinking about, oh, I'm noticing this particular group is being excluded. The second thing is, going back to that question I shared earlier, be willing to ask, like, how can I make this space safe for you? What is it that I can do to invite you to the conversation? What's missing? Again, this is a great question to ask your team. This is a great question to repeat. It's a great question to ask one-on-one -on -one. because what'll happen is people will start to give you little clues. And here's the thing, don't expect a direct answer because folks don't know how to fix their own stuff. <laughs> but what they will do is give you something that you'll be able to say, huh, I've heard this a few times. And you can start to figure out how to solve for that something. You know, the something could be, you know, I'm just not really sure that when we're in this environment that people really want to hear what I have to say. What that could be really messaging to you is that you should say, hey, Amber, I'd love to hear your perspective, right? That you need to invite that person more. And so collecting that kind of data, like asking that question, what can I do to make this space safe for you can give you some directions on what you can do. Start there. Ultimately, a lot of this stuff, we like to solve problems like big things like, oh, let's make a big program. Let's do, sometimes it's really literally the individual level and how we communicate and speak to each other. What can you as an individual do? If you start to look at it that way, and people start to see you do it because, you know, we copy each other, right? We imitate each other. So we do it. Other folks are going to see it. They're going to do it too. Suddenly you got a whole new culture that's inviting, that's including folks, that's having the tough conversation. So like, it's really just about doing some of those things and just doing them over and over and over before you build a program that's focused on X, Y, and Z. Because a lot of times that's trying to fix the people and not really trying to fix the problem. Great. Any other perspectives? Amber, I mean, what, what do you add to that? <laughs> that right. was so good, Amber. <laughs> I was sitting over here like, that's so good. I thought that was fantastic. I have nothing to add. Incredible, Amber. Mm -hmm. Let's see, I'm flipping through. I did see a question about your pins. Yes, 
radical dreams if that's my or was that for melissa's cameo that for? <laughs> <laughs> i don't know maybe both of you Aunt melissa you're selling pins and amber you're wearing them both of you answer the question <laughs> So I actually um, partnered with a woman named Takara. She is a Black woman who lives on the south side of Chicago, and she actually has her own production house um, where she offers 3D printing and does, um, she's helping me execute a small clothing line and six piece run. So um, it's, I just thought it was super important for people who wanted to wear did not want to wear just maybe the cameo t-shirt, but maybe they could advocate in their own way with something a little bit more, um, you know, fashion forward, easy to take on and take off. So um, it's very, I wear mine every day. I have a ring that I'm coming out with. Um, I, I think it's important to wear just so people can ask those questions are like, oh, I've never seen a black cameo. Um, <laughs> and I do get that a lot. And, you know, it's kind of sad that they haven't seen it before because a cameo is historically, um, an image of beauty and the fact that, you know, none have been made with an African-American woman on it is just, it is shocking, but that's where, that's where I come in. <laughs> My pen is just a lapel pen. It's not a big deal. I, it's Radical it Dreams is. is the name of it. It's kneeling Colin Kaepernick. I'm sure you all probably yes. know the history of that. And um, I try, this is my fun. I try to put a little fun in everything I do so people will do exactly what just happened, which is ask about it so we can start mm -hmm. to have some of those tough conversations. Well, you know, we are the accessories council. So we yes. can always <laughs> expect to have questions on what you're wearing and who made it and where it came from. So I love I that. I love it. So I know the co your, your um Contact information is in the chat, but if anyone would like to reach out directly, you can reach out to myself or Lena and we will um, pass you on to the right, uh, the right person on the panel. Uh, ladies, thank you so much. First of all, for your time, I know how busy you are. So to carve, uh, you know, carve this out into your day, we really, really appreciate it. Um, for your candidness and sharing your wisdom. I thank you for joining us. And, um, you know, we will, I hope we, as an industry, um, make everybody proud. So, yeah. Thank you, Karen, well. for the time. Thank you actually for extending. I know we're a little over, but thank you for extending the time um, and the invitation to have the conversation about diversity in fashion. We look forward to coming back. Um, and we, uh, enjoy your week. We can't wait. Thank this you. Awesome. Thank you Bye. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So for everyone, hang in with us. We have a, a, a session coming up. Hold on with the team from Cassandra. Um, so we're gonna go back into statistics and information. Um, and I am so excited to meet Kathy and Michael um, who will uh, be our presenters today. But we're gonna give everybody a few minutes to stretch. I will be back in three minutes with Kathy and Michael. Um, Stay tuned and we will talk to you very soon.
everybody. So excited to introduce you to the team from Cassandra. Michael, you say you're Kathy on there, but we know you're Michael. <laughs> I'm Michael, yes, exactly. <laughs> so first of all, thank you so much for joining us. And I have to be honest with you, um, you know, our, our holding screen did not quite share how cool and unique and creative your titles were because it did say Kathy Sheehan, Senior Vice President, but really what it says on their website is she is the trend maven. And Michael, you are the problem solver. And I love, <laughs> I love those titles. Um, but, and I'll let you tell more about uh, Cassandra and what you do, and we can't wait to hear. Cultural strategists, business intelligence experts, anticipation of shifts in the market and special, specializing on Gen Z, um, how to brand, position your brand and come up with strategies for the future. Something that all of our companies need to know and be aware of. Uh, I will turn it over to you. I'm gonna encourage everyone, ask questions along the way. That way we can um, come back to them at the end of the presentation. You can put them in the chat, you can put them in the Q&A, you can send them to me. Um, but Kathy and Michael, welcome. And thank, thank you very much, Karen. Um, thanks for the introduction as well. Um, my name is Mike Cordy, VP of Business Development at Cassandra and joining me is Kathy Sheen, SVP um, of Cassandra, and head of Cassandra. Um, really excited to be part of the Accessories Council's 20, 2021 business workshop. So hope everyone has enjoyed the sessions thus far. Um, as Karen was saying, today we're going to be speaking about Gen Z, all things Gen Z culture, um, and really the impact this cohort is having on businesses across all verticals and all industries. Um, Kathy, do we have the presentation up yet? Yes, I am sharing it. Do you not see it? Got it. Hold on one second. Because if not, I'll now stop. I see. Great. Oh, okay. You can see okay. for a second, it just came up. Okay. Awesome. Um, so all things Gen Z, we're going to cover a lot of things uh, this afternoon, but really this is going to be four parts that we'll be looking at. Um, we're going to be looking at how they're rethinking what really matters to them. You know, there's a lot that it's hard to miss for them that because they haven't really even experienced it as an Older generations, you know, I'm an older millennial. There's a lot that I have FOMO about, um, but there are things that they haven't even experienced yet. So how is that gonna impact them and what matters to them? We're gonna be looking at power structure. You know, um, it's simply not enough to be, you know, woke if you're Gen Z. They really wanna be change agents um, and champion of causes that matter to them. Um, so that's something we'll be touching on. We'll be specifically looking at the accessories category, obviously, and how they are having an impact on this space. And then also looking at how they're rethinking and reprioritizing um, experiences and community as we move forward from the pandemic. So um, one thing we get asked a lot often is, you know, who and why Cassandra? What's behind the name? And actually, um, Cassandra comes comes from Greek mythology. Uh, Cassandra was the um, daughter of the king of Troy, and um, Apollo actually fell in love with her and she, and he gave her uh, the gift of prophecy, but she actually denied his advances. And because of this, he cursed her so that nobody would actually believe anything that she said, any of her predictions. Um, and she actually foresaw the destruction of Troy, um, but no one believed her. So at Cassandra, we like to say that we've embraced this legend, um, but we broke the curse um, by empowering our clients to see the, see tomorrow um, and help future their businesses. And we do this by, you know, studying youth. Um, we are youth experts, um, strategists, innovators for brands. We look at 14 to 34 year olds. We look at these, these cohorts, which happen to be Gen Z's and millennials right now, because we believe they um, have the ability to really impact um, not only the culture, um, but, the, but how other generations are ultimately going to be engaging with your brands. Um, so we look at 14 to 34 year olds, the general population, but we also look at a subset of trendsetters um, within this 14 to 34 year old segment. 
Um, we have our own proprietary panel called the Cassandra Collective. And within the trendsetter community there, um, they represent about a seventh and nine percent incidence rate compared to the general, pop general population. And they are true innovators and early adopters who are constantly in discovery mode, have a lot of ins influence over their peers, their community. Um, and through our screeners, we've been able to identify trendsetters that have been um, predictive of trends about three to five years ahead of the general population. So on our team, our um, cultural anthropologists are constantly looking at these emergent, emerging movements in popular culture, how consumption patterns are changing, behaviors and preferences, and ultimately what things trendsetters are driving that will be adopted by the general population overall. Um, a little bit about Gen Z. You know, Gen Z is not, um, they are not millennials. Um, they are truly their own generation with distinct values, preferences, behaviors. Um, they were born between 1997 and 2012. So right now they'd be between the ages of nine and 24. They represent about 20% of the US population and are actually the most diverse generation ever. Um, close to 50% um, are non-white. And they have a ton of spending power, um, over 140 billion in spending power and a lot of influence on, in, in the consumer space, um, how you work with them in, as employees and culture overall, they're true disruptors. You know, one thing that's interesting about Gen Z is they are the true digital natives. Um, you know, they have seen a seamless integration, you know, of online and analog worlds, extremely savvy on digital platforms, social media, e-commerce, and even re-commerce. So they're driving a lot of what we're seeing in the digital world. And they've also had, a, you know, been born into a lot of disruption. Um, you know, obviously we're seeing that right now with social and health crisis, but they've been into, you know, a world of economic crisis, political crisis, environmental turmoil. So, you know, they really feel an obligation to have um, a positive change and a role to, you know, um, lead that change in these areas. And they are very close with their parents. Um, they, um, if you go back to one slide, Kathy, uh, very close with their parents, put a lot of emphasis on confidence, grit, um, and excellence. So overall, with Gen Z, there are really three things, you know, we wanted to say about them. Um, if you go to the next slide, they are extremely practical, uh, resilient. Um, they are, like I was saying, they are champions of many different causes. And compared to other generations that put a lot of emphasis on physical health, on top of this, they really believe in a mental health and are championing those causes as well. Great, so I'll take it from here. Um, one of the things that we've, when we've been studying Gen Z is at this time, 2020, 2021, how much of this is a defining moment in terms of our culture, in terms of when we look at the different generations, but really for Gen Z, this is um, an extreme def defining moment for this generation. And we think the experiences that they have had in the last year to 18 months are gonna be really the hallmarks of this generation uh, moving forward. And so it's not only the pandemic that they have experienced and continue to experience, but we have really seen tremendous social, political, you know, Mike used the term disruption. Um, when you think about the disruptive events that have really happened in the last 18 months, the pandemic being just one of those, we see that this is a generation that is now coming of age in, you know, we saw a lot of differences between Gen Zs and millennials. And as they have come of age in the last few years, they have gone through more than prior generations. And we believe that this is really going to continue to define and um, provide the contours of this generation. So what we are seeing with Gen Z is that um, they are literally rethinking everything. So this past year to 18 months have has really created 
a pause for many people, not just Gen Zs, many people, but particularly for Gen Zs, this notion of rethinking everything. We're seeing that they are reevaluating their priorities. They're deciding what's most important to them, what's what they want to let go, um, and are moving forward through this pandemic with um, a new intention. And we believe that this new intention is going to impact all of our clients. It's going to impact all categories, including the accessory space. Um, so we're going to take you through a couple chapters here in terms of where we see this reassessment with Gen Z's. And the first area we want to talk about is how Gen Z's are rethinking what really matters to them. And as Mike said, Mike in the introduction talked about FOMO. Um, Gen Z's have had the rug pulled out of them in a lot of different ways in the last 18 months. So if we go back to really the beginning of the pandemic, you had as you know, the lockdowns happened in last spring, many hallmarks um, and life stage moments of what it means to be an adult were literally taken away from you know millions of young people really in just a couple of weeks so you think about things like you know your high school graduation your college graduation going to prom um, a milestone birthday getting your driver's license many of these things in a very short order came to you know a, a really pronounced halt and took on different meaning and a, and a different way of access so we see that gen z's have really had a lot of disruption that happened um, really, really quickly and at the same time. And one of the terms that we've been looking at is this notion of FOMO, which really defines the millennials, that fear of missing out. And thinking about it, what it means to move from a model of FOMO to NOMO, which is the no moments. So some of those moments that you really looked forward to as a young person, having them not happen at all, being postponed, you know, in some cases indefinitely, um, having them really take on a new format perhaps. So we see Gen Z's as this generation that is, you know, increasingly experiencing the loss of moments or uh, no moments. And as a result um, of having some of these no moments, um, being closer to home, having um, social activities disruptive, we have really seen a trend emerge that has become more and more pronounced through the pandemic, and that is the, the trend of intentional living. So really taking a moment to think about reflecting on what's most important to you, what defines you, what makes your identity, and really having a much sharper focus at a much younger age of what is most important to these individuals and in turn this, this group of people as a generation. So one of the trends we are talking to our clients a lot about is this notion of intentional living and what does that mean and how does that manifest? Um, we see it does manifest in the health and wellness space. So a lot of young people, um, you know, talking about how they were thinking about the pandemic, how they were really, um, you know, we've been talking about self-care for a while now, but really honed in on this concept of self-care and looking out for themselves. And I think this is just something, you know, we wrote this slide before the Olympics, you know, um, the last couple of weeks, but, you know, some of the events around um, the Olympics and the focus on mental health and mental well-being, I think just, again, underscored this notion of a redefinition of what's most important to um, young people. And we see among um, Gen Z's that at eight out of 10 say it's important for um, the people they look up to. So be it their school, their teachers, or if they're already in the wor workforce, their employers to really think about um, mental health and prioritize it. So this is something, you know, eight out of 10, I think, again, just underscores how important this is um, to this generation. And again, almost eight out of 10 agree with the statement they've reevaluated their life plans and their path as a result of the pandemic. So a real strong reassessment. Um, a lot of this are, is around um, the family. 
Mike mentioned at the beginning that, you know, the relationship between Gen Z's and their parents really strong. In many cases, this has become amplified as a result of the pandemic. Many young people saying that they, you know, got closer with their parents um, because they were perhaps forced to be home, but not seeing that as like, you know, a negative or, you know, something that kind of takes away from their ability to be an adult. But in the, in many cases, you know, seeing this as a positive and seeing it as an opportunity um, to foster relationships with their families in, in ways that they, they didn't before because, you know, they weren't at home or they were too busy or there were too many other things going on. So for many young people really seeing this as um, a benefit and an opportunity. Um, we do see that in terms of how um, young people think about um, the way they're spending their free time, not surprising. Media has had a big uptick as a result of the pandemic. And we've done, Mike and I have done a lot of work that's we're not gonna um, share with you today, but really about uh, entertainment and leisure and social media and how that has been really something that has carried many young people um, through the pandemic. Um, but I bring it up here in terms of the accessories category because we're gonna talk in a few slides about how social media and the concept of discovery of new products has kind of gone into overdrive as a result of the pandemic and also um, you know channels and how people are, are shopping engaging online and um, in person as well so we see that um, there's a lot of um, disruptions happening in terms of how young people think about the brands and products that they are um, interacting with, sorry, my slide skipped ahead a little bit. Um, but we also see that for um, Gen Z's, when they think about their paths moving forward, um, much more entrepreneurial than prior generations. Um, we see that there's been, um, some people are calling it the Fauci effect. So, um, you know, an uptick in uh, young people applying to med school and nursing programs. So this again has been an opportunity um, to reassess. And we are talking to our clients as well, not only from, you know, a marketing business standpoint, but also from an employee relations standpoint and what young people are looking for um, from future employers. This is, you know, definitely thinking about that entrepreneurial spirit, but also that idea of, you know, how important mental health is and how they are looking for integration within their lives and not to kind of, you know, go into the workforce and turn off who they are as individuals, but really looking for um, employers and organizations to be sensitive and cognizant to who they are as individuals. Um, so what does this mean for, um, you know, folks on today's call? Um, we definitely think this idea of living with intention, um, reevaluating everything, um, refocusing on what matters is something all of our clients should be paying attention to. And in your space, thinking about how do you continue to introduce meaning into the brands and products that you're, um, you know, creating and, and sharing with this generation, because they are certainly looking for things that kind of marry their intention and, and their focus moving forward. Um, Second area we want to share with you is this notion of how Gen Z's are rethinking the power structure. And then we already talked a little bit about this when we think about the um, relationship that Gen Z's have with work and employers and what they want to, um, what they hope to get from that. But we do see that this is a generation that has really moved from being bystanders to upstanders. So taking a proactive role, taking responsibility, um, you know, much more, one of the things we saw pre-pandemic was this generation, just as they came of age in school, much more in tune with things like climate change and other social issues. And that is something that has just gone into overdrive in the last 18 months in terms of how important it is for Gen Z's to feel like they are part of the solution, that they are taking a stand, and that they are, um, you know, being proactive in um, the social dialogue. 
Um, so nine out of 10 of our Gen Z trendsetters, and again, the trendsetters are um, the folks that Mike referenced who are really those kind of leading edge indicators of um, where like the zeitgeist might be going. Nine out of 10 say they have become more self-aware in the past year, which is, this is, I think, a remarkable statistic um, given what we know about Gen Z, what we know that they are already, you know, self-aware that it has increased in the last year is pretty, um, to me, is a pretty remarkable um, statistic. So this is something that in some cases we're kind of like at the beginning, we're still at the beginning of it. Um, they believe that being cool is about, you know, being involved in social issues. So, um, you know, they are kind of getting under the hood in terms of what people stand for and what they say and whether that is true and authentic. Um, so a strong desire for, um, you know, people their age to be involved in social causes. And, but there is also a sense of being overwhelmed. And we see this in a few different areas with Gen Z. There's this strong desire to be active and proactive, but also a recognition of there's like, there are a lot of issues, there are a lot of problems. Um, and, um, you know, can sometimes and many times feel overwhelmed. And we actually see this when it comes to social causes, um, in terms of wanting help to understand what issues are most important, where they can play the, the most active role. Um, but this, this sense of being overwhelmed doesn't just sit in the, the social causes space. Um, I mentioned we do, we've done a lot of work in the entertainment space. And, you know, this is a group that, you know, young people are always looking for the latest and the greatest and, and trying to discover, you know, new artists and new platforms. Um, so there is that desire for the new but which isn't necessarily new for, for young people. But what is new with Gen Z is this admitting that it is something that takes a lot of energy and can be exhausting. So I think we have, you know, kind of some trends and counter trends. There is this more awareness and desire to be involved, but also recognition of the hard work, right? And looking for um, partners and looking, you know, feeling overwhelmed with many of the problems that exist today in society. So the implications here is that Gen Z's are rethinking the power structure and that is going to impact every kind of commercial decision that they make and their expectations of industries, of brands, of products, of categories. And I think for all of our clients, this means that you will have a population that is far more critical about sources, supply chain, distribution, waste, sustainability, and labor practices. So they are really looking for companies and brands to be good citizens in ways that we have not yet seen. Um, so I think this is something for all of our, um, you know, for everyone on the phone to think about, you know, your, what you're doing, how are you representing that in an authentic way um, and thinking about, um, you know, everything that your your brand, everything along the supply chain, really evaluating that and understanding, are you living up to the expectations that this generation um, has of business and brands today? Um, Want to do a little bit specific to the category. We've kind of been general in terms of, you know, Gen Z as a generation. We did in preparation for today's presentation um, speak to some of the young people on our Cassandra Collective, which uh, Mike mentioned is our always on community of global Gen Z and millennial trendsetters. And we wanted to get a little closer to the category in terms of how they feel about accessories, what they're thinking about. Um, and one of the learnings we had is that there is very much this notion that it ties it all together. So when people talk about accessories, they see it as something that, you know, kind of puts the icing on the cake in terms of their appearance, their outfit, and also how they represent themselves as individuals, very important for their identity. And it is something that is really seen as, you know, tying it all together. Um, so this is something we heard again and again from the young people we spoke to on our Cassandra Collective. Um, it also, in terms of the, 
the shopping experience for accessories. I think there's a lot of um, serendipity in uh, this space among Gen Z and millennials. So when we looked at um, in-person shopping, um, there is, you know, a lot of young people say they don't necessarily go out um, into a retail environment to specifically look for accessories all the time. But if they're out shopping for something else, it is something that, again, ties it all together. So um, that point of sale, really important for the, this generation, um, because we see a lot of, again, that serendipity uh, of discovery and also um, online that idea of you know discovery pulling it together um, having something recommended is in many cases really appreciated and when we look at online shopping behaviors that idea of discovery I think is so important so many young people when they talk about say a favorite accessory that they might have or the last accessory they bought it isn't, and especially if they bought it online, it isn't that they, you know, saw an ad for it. It is something that they discovered. So that notion of, you know, really kind of, um, you know, discovery and I found it is so very important for young people today and really, really prevalent when we talk about accessories. Um, accessories are very important to identity. Um, we have, um, and we're not going to play this video, but we do have, um, you know, many people on our Cassandra Collective who um, are non-binary in um, their gender identity. And, you know, thinking about um, kind of traditional gender roles and accessories um, and really playing with accessories as part of that identity. I think that is something that is you know, somewhat new with Gen Z. And again, we're going to see more of that because we do see that, you know, when we look at the generational cohorts, Gen Z is much more likely. We, in our latest study, about a third of Gen Z's identify as LGBTQ+. Um, so there's a lot of fluidity in terms of gender identity and accessories is one area that um, I think really um, they look to for how they define themselves and how they, they define their identity. Um, and this was one young person that um, had gone through a gender transition. Um, and I love this, uh, what he said in terms of um, thinking about particularly jewelry, and he was talking about earrings um, and how that is something um, that was a little bit tricky for him in terms of his transition, but um, now how accessories can really be very much a part of his narrative of who he is and gives him much more flexibility to tell a personal story about himself in ways that clothing can't. And this is a theme, I think it's very, Sai articulated very well in this, in what he told us. But uh, again, we did hear this notion of kind of the flexibility of accessories um, playing in a different space than, you know, other, other categories uh, of apparel. So uh, I think more fluid and more, you know, more kind of playfulness in the category. And then lastly, the area we see is um, accessories and social, such an important um, platform in terms of discovery, inspiration, um, finding the newest trends. Um, this is something that has, has been there for this generation, but truly exploded um, I think during the pandemic in terms of, you know, just maybe having a little bit more um, downtime, the ability to, you know, feeling a little bit freer to experiment if they, you know, were home more. Um, so lots of activity in um, the social space around um, personal grooming, cosmetics and accessories. Um, with that, I think, Mike, I'm going to turn it back to you. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah. So for our last um, topic we want to cover is how Gen Z is rethinking life um, and the pandemic, obviously, you know, how are they reprioritizing experiences um, and community? And, you know, one thing that we've seen a lot in our community is that um, they're really hoping for more out of home experiences and milestone moments that, you know, either they didn't experience in the past or took for granted. 
Um, you know, one thing is that we're seeing a lot of um, the Gen Z um, youth that we speak to actually missing school. You know, they thought they would they wouldn't miss those <clears throat> in, um, in person events um, back before the pandemic. But as you can see here from Victor 15, Illinois, none of us really like school, but we miss it now. Um, my most immediate goal is to get back to school. Um, so that's a common thing we're seeing, um, whether it's school itself, graduation, uh, the prom, these sort of events. And then, you know, in terms of like bucket list for 2021, a big thing is travel um, in, in, you know, those sort of um, experiences that come with travel, you know, whether it's traveling for a vacation with family, um, you know, going to events like birthday parties or con concerts or festivals. We've already seen that, you know, about 55% of Gen Z have already planned a trip to take over the next 12 months. So um, that's something that definitely seems to be um, a common theme on bucket list for 2021 going into 22. And then, you know, um, we've all, all generations, we have to really spend this pandemic really thinking about um, how we're going to calculate, you know, the risks we take and what we, we do in our everyday lives. Um, and that isn't, that's true of Gen Z as well. What we're seeing with Gen Z though, um, is that they really miss connecting more than other generations with, with culture. You know, whether that is going to those sort of events like concerts and festivals, um, movies, you know, any sort of um, leisure um, establishments, and they're more eager to do those things now. Um, they're more likely than older generations to take those risks. Um, and we're actually seeing that they're less likely than, say, boomers or Xers um, to do things such as in-store shopping um, or dining out um, as we come out of the pandemic. We've also looked at um, this life in the pandemic through the lens of finance. And we actually see that, you know, despite one in three Gen Z saying they are financially better off than they were a year ago, you know, about two thirds believe that they will be financially better off a year from now. Um, so they're seeing, a, they're showing a lot more optimism um, about the future of financial institutions and their situations than older generations. Um, and, you know, we're already seeing this um, translating into a rise in discretionary spending. Um, we're seeing them open their wallets for the sort of things we were talking about before, those sort of out of home experiences that they really want to enjoy that they haven't taken advantage of um, over the last 18 months. So overall, we, we're looking at Gen Z's as being a lot more um, optimistic, but cautiously optimistic compared to other generations, older generations. And like all of us are gonna be continuing to rethink, recalibrate, um, the risks they take, what they're prioritizing um, as we go out and navigate uh, this year into 2022. And, you know, so finally, like the big three takeaways that we have um, about Gen Z um, right now is that they are true disruptors, you know, uh, culturally. Um, they're really rethinking how they're um, and revisiting everything about their lives. Um, they are looking at a more balanced approach to health, you know, especially mental health um, and have true expectations um, and high expectations to get there. Um, and they're experimenting. Um, they're more about trial observation and very flexible um, in terms of their outlook and how they're gonna approach life. Um, so with that, you know, we'd love to open it up to any questions you have. Um, we can check the chat here to see if anything has come through. Um, but definitely raise your hand if you have any questions about what we've covered um, or some of the things that, you know, we haven't covered that you have questions about that may be impacting your brand. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, if you just put your questions into the chat, you could put them into the Q&A. Um, or you could text them to me either way. I have to say, owning a Gen Z son, <laughs> uh, I have experienced it. So much of your presentation really resonated on, you know, um, what he wants, the brands and, and uh, you know, the motivation just seems a little bit, certainly a little bit different than my millennial daughter, um, for sure. Any questions? We hear that often. Quiet group today. 
very quiet group. Well, let me ask a question. How do you work with companies? How, like, how would you engage if one of our companies wanted to work with Cassandra? What, um, what would they do next? Yeah, sure. We work, we're very flexible in terms of how we work with um, our clients. Um, we do have like a syndicated offering um, where we're pushing out insights and data on a monthly basis to our clients around what we're observing um, in terms of these emerging movements and what that means for brands from a marketing and product and innovation standpoint. Um, so there's various membership programs that we offer our clients uh, to work with you on a monthly basis. But then we do a lot of um, custom um, consulting projects, um, whether that's on the workshop side or you know primary research side. Um, and one thing that we do there is we obviously leverage the syndicated research that we have, um, the library of reports um, that we've published over the years um, that helps us do things at scale, um, both from a timeline and both investment standpoint. Um, and it really helps us you know, start from a different level in terms of what we know about a specific vertical industry or space that you're looking to you know, tackle. Yeah, and I'll just piggyback on that. Our, um, our Cassandra Collective, we use that for research in, in writing the Cassandra report, but we also, the Cassandra Collective is available for clients to tap into. So, um, and, and we have found that that has been a really great vehicle, particularly for quick turnaround research. So um, if you have a concept, a concept test, or just want to get a, a, you know, a, a qualitative read on, um, um, I see there's a chat, um, if, you know, a qualitative read on an issue or an idea, um, generally we can post that to the Cassandra Collective and get answers to our clients within a few business days. So it's a really um, quick turnaround. Um, like we've had clients use that when they want to get insights like about up upcoming holidays or say something has happened, you know, in the media that they want a really quick read or uh, reaction to. So the Cassandra Collective is, is always available. And then, as Mike said, we're, we're a full service um, market research agency. So we have the ability to do um, custom qualitative, custom quantitative work, you know, all with the foundation of what we already know about young people from our, our syndicated work in the Cassandra report. That's wonderful. All right, well, we clearly have a shy group today, but mm -hmm. I took the liberty, I shared your contact information uh, in the chat. So if anybody wants to reach out directly, if you have a question that you weren't comfortable sharing, um, sharing with the group, you'll have their, uh, their contact information. And of course you can reach out to us. And I thank you both for your time and an amazing presentation and just sharing, uh, sharing your insights. It's, um, it's fascinating. And I just see a comment. I have two Gen Zers spot on. <laughs> Agree. <laughs> no, it's great. Thank you for the time. And, you know, obviously anyone can reach out to us, but also we do have a daily newsletter we push out. Um, and then on some Fridays, we, we, uh, we turn that into a podcast and anyone can sign up to receive these uh, newsletters. It's basically a um, you know, high level trends, micro trends we're seeing in different industries. Um, and you just go to Cassandra.co. Um, there's a daily, you know, icon, um, or button you click on it and you can just sign up for, for, uh, that newsletter. It's like 30, 45 second read every morning. Excellent. I just put that into the chat and again, we really appreciate it. Thanks so much for, uh, for joining us this afternoon. Thank Thanks you for inviting care. us. Yeah, definitely. Take thank care. Bye. Bye. And thank you for joining our business workshop day two. Next week, we'll be back with fashion presentation, money, money, money. We're going to talk about how to get it for your company and how to invest it. And um, we have some great experts that will be joining us. So hopefully we will see you all next week. If you haven't voted yet, go to accessoriescouncil.org and Anybody can vote on the Design Excellence Awards. The finalists have been announced. It's out there, it's fun, we need your input. And we will look forward to seeing you all next Monday. And you can ask me how Las Vegas was. A few people commented on the interesting art behind me. I am in 
uh, the Delano hotel room um, and thankful that the internet service held up for us, but that is not my personal crazy art on the wall. Anyway, <laughs> thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Talk to you soon.